And so, dear brothers and sisters, we begin our Holy Week with the Lord's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. And the story moves on very quickly, as, as we just heard in, in our Gospel, from apparent triumph and people even laying down their cloaks. Now, obviously, keep in mind, back in the day, if you had a cloak or something, it's not like you had 15 of them. It's not like there was a pennies around the corner where they had a huge selection of cloaks. Uh, these things were fairly precious because you didn't have very many of them. They were, they were expensive, they were hard to get, they were all handmade. Uh, so in order to do that, you'd have to really, really believe uh, there's something special here. Uh, I just want to draw three very brief details out of the story because uh, the details always, always make a difference and they always have something to, to say to us and something to teach us. So just three little details, if I may. Uh, first one is that when... The apostles are, are at the Last Supper. The Lord says that he will be betrayed by someone who's dipping into the same dish as him. Okay? Now, traditionally, when we see any images of the Last Supper, you have Jesus at the center. John is going to recline on his heart. So John is generally to this side, left-hand side, side of the heart. And then St. Peter, since uh, he's uh, the, the head of the apostles, would generally be to the Lord's right, if the right hand, the right side. It's kind of the, the side where your, your most important second in command is going to go. So that's traditionally how, how these things are, are, are depicted. But what's very interesting is, uh, in, in one of the other versions of this, is taken from Mark today, but in one of the other synoptics, um, Peter signals to John to ask Jesus, who is it? Right? So Peter is going to ask John, who is it that's going to betray Jesus? Now, Jesus is sitting here, and Peter is sitting there, and John is sitting there. How is Peter going to ask John who is it that's going to betray him without Jesus in the middle hearing or seeing? I mean, it's pretty obvious, like, what's happening. But if the person who's going to betray him is able to dip his bread in the same dish as Jesus, it means he's within arm's length. This was an observation made by, by Fulton Sheen, so Archbishop Fulton Sheen. So who's to say if it actually wasn't Judas at the Lord's right hand side and Peter and John over here? So then Jesus is able to dip into the same dish as Judas. It's just this, it, this incredible, incredible image of, of, of the Lord's mercy. I mean... Maybe it's just me, maybe it's just kind of the fighting Irish spirit I have, but if I knew someone was going to betray me, genie lads, I'd, um, I'd, I'd avoid them. I'd avoid them, and I'd arrange someone to slash their tires. And, <laughs> and, do you know? But the last thing I'd do would be to draw them even closer, because you are going to hurt me. I, 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 maybe that's just my, it's my lack of love, admittedly. Uh, but my goodness to keep Judas even closer, knowing what he's going to do and knowing what the consequences of it are. Now, obviously, Jesus knows the big picture as well, that this has to happen. But still, he, he still has a human nature that, that in, in some way still calls out to his father, saying, look, if it's any way possible, let this cup pass me by, because this, this is going to be hard. This is going to be very, very difficult. That's one detail. Second detail. Barabbas, for even, even with, with kind of really basic Hebrew, like I have about six words and I'm about to use two of them. Um, Abba is a, a Hebrew word, we all know what that means. Abba means father. And in some translations of, of, of some of the Gospels, you'll, you'll hear the, the expression, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. Simon bar Jonah, bar means son. Bar Abbas means son of the father. So it's like there's, there's, this, there's this earthly, well, that's one of the possible translations. There, there are a number, but that's one of the possible translations of his name. That, that the, the son of the father is rejected in favor of another son of the father. This son of the father is innocent, is pure, has a divine nature, the son of the father that's released in favor of him is a criminal. And in the movie like The Passion of the Christ, uh, when they bring out Barabbas, like, you know, they deliberately make him a really a 
hideous looking character. You know, he's uh, just a real crowd stirrer. Um, yeah, really rough character. So there's this, there's this, there's this parallel, you know, between the, 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 the immolated lamb, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus with no sin, versus this character who, who is guilty and who, in his, what's interesting about the movie as well, is that when, they, when, when Bar Barabbas comes down, even though the chief priests and the scribes, they were the ones who incited the crowd, come on, free Barabbas instead, free Barabbas instead. Uh, when he comes down to them, he, he's, he's like, he walks over to them, they're like, yeah, 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 get out of the way, get out of the way. They free him in favor of Jesus, but they don't love him, they don't care. It was just, just whatever they had to do to kill Jesus. So there's, there's, this, there's this parallel and this juxtaposition of, of, of innocence versus, versus guilt, and the people choose guilt. They choose criminality. They choose this horrible character in favor of Jesus. So it's like they're just, they're, there are multiple levels of uh, rejection that Jesus experiences here. Obviously, we're, we're aware of the, the, the clearest ones. We'll be speaking about those during the week, the actual passion and crucifixion itself. But there are so many details that just see... Uh, like time and time and time again, Jesus is rejected and pushed away. There's a, a, a rather odd detail <clears throat> that when Jesus bows his head and dies, it says the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Firstly, why? And secondly, even if, yeah, so it did happen, but why include that in the gospel? In a way, like, so what? A curtain was torn. What's, what's the big deal? Why, why mention that right here? So, obviously in the temple, <clears throat> the temple had multiple courtyards, right? And degrees of, if you will, sanctity. So the outer courtyard is for the Gentiles. So uh, pagans, people who might be kind of interested in, in Judaism, but they're not Jews, they're not circumcised. Then you've got the inner court. That's where the sacrifices would have actually taken place. So the Jewish fathers would come over with, with the lamb to present it to the priest. The priest would take it off them, um, cut the troth, and so on and so forth. We'll go into that in a little more detail during the week. Uh, the, the, the lamb would be sacrificed there. Uh, the lamb would be, sorry, the, the entrails and the blood would be sprinkled on the altar, and then the, the lamb is given back to the, to the family for the Passover meal. But then there's the, the Holy of Holies, the inner part of the temple, where there was a, a great big curtain as, as an indication, this is, is where God resides, okay? So there's, uh, there's a, d a degree of kind of necessary separation. You know, you're not God. We don't just kind of wander around the temple as if it's nothing special. It's where God resides. It's a holy place. Now, this curtain then separating the Holy of Holies from the people is now torn. What's it saying? What does that mean? It means that the divinity of God is now made visible, now made manifest. We can now see it. Why is that? In Jesus' human nature, in dying, the greatest attribute of God is revealed, his mercy and his love. So that kind of, the veiled understanding that we would have had of God, you know, is God angry, is God kind of vengeful, is God... Uh, just a creator, but very, very distant, powerful, but not really interested in me, away in his happy clouds. Like, this, this veil now is, now is now torn. The separation is now broken. And now we see the love of God. We see what he is willing to do out of love for us. The veil is lifted. It's, it's a beautiful little detail. We now see God as he, as he is all love and compassion. So as we enter into this, this Holy Week now, we ask the Lord to renew our faith in him, to renew our understanding of him as a loving Savior who guides us to the heart of our infinitely loving Father. Amen.